thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. It is a privilege to have with us here today Commissioner Ettinger, who, among a number of other things, is responsible for language services. He made time to join us uh, for a short period of time to address the forum, and this indicates the importance that this commission shows on language services and multilingualism. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Thank you. Dear Deputy Director General, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, coming from the Parlement, I was not sure should I speak in English or in German. Then I heard about translation. So to use our services and the competences of my colleagues, I will speak in my mother thank you in German for to send out a clear signal that they are important for our Commission and European Union's work. 1958. In 1958, in 1958, so 60 years ago, a long time ago, the first regulation which was adopted by the um, European Economic Community dealt with languages and the recognition of official languages. So the founding fathers, founding mothers as well, passed a regulation which recognised that all official languages have the same status in the European Union. It was French, Italian, Dutch and German at the time. And we have stuck to this principle through various um, enlargements, uh, six member states, nine member states, 12 member states, uh, 28 member states uh, uh, now. And of course, we'll carry on sticking um, to this uh, principle, even when the United Kingdom leaves uh, the European Union next uh, uh, year. English remains, of course, an official working language, an official language of the European Union. The other official languages remain so as well. If you look over the, um, the history of the European Union and the history of Europe, uh, Europe is multicultural. If you look at um, what's happened throughout, uh, the Europe, throughout Europe, uh, Europe is multicultural at all levels. And if this uh, multiculturalism is to survive, and multilingualism is to survive, then we can only do this through communication, where we can meet people, um, where we can make uh, questions and answers understandable to everybody, principles understandable to everybody. The European Union is a union of democracy, and everybody has the right to um, make an active and a passive choice. We want people to be properly represented in the European Parliament, in the Council, in the European Commission, in the other institutions as well. But if we want to do that and we want to communicate with all 500 million people in the European Union, then of course we can't expect them all to be perfectly multilingual. You are, it's your job, it's your profession, it's also your vacation. It's more than a job really, it's a vacation. But um, when it comes to um, when it comes to people from a, a vineyard um, owner in uh, Rioja or people working in uh, my area of uh, Germany in Baden-Württemberg who are very competent in their work and in their profession but uh, they don't really feel that apart from Spanish or apart from Schwabisch that they should speak three or four other languages and um, they feel but at the same time they want to be taken seriously in Brussels. They um, want uh, to be able to ask, answer questions and get answers. They want their representatives to be able to uh, speak their, their mother tongues in the European Parliament. They want to get answers to their questions um, in their mother tongue. And that's very important. And the digital revolution, of course, as well, 
has to ensure that these 24 official languages are recognised and kept, and that's central to the, to the future of the European Union, that we have open communication and a clear understanding of what we're actually doing. Now, I don't know what the world will look like in the year 2100, when your grandchildren are alive. I don't know what the world will look like then, but I know that for the next uh, 20, 30, 40 years, the human contact is very important. I'm often involved in video conferences. It's not bad. You can communicate um, the data from Luxembourg to Brussels to Paris to Berlin. But I think the human contact, direct contact with people, how they speak, but also their body language, looking them in the eyes, hearing what tone they're speaking to you in, i.e. are they open, are they a bit aggressive, are they on the defensive, are they more negative, are they very motivated and keen? I think that this is something that um, a digital broadcast can't actually um, can't actually convey, which is why conferences, discussions in meeting rooms, conferences here. I mean, this conference, for example, could have been broadcast online. You could have all been in your offices around the around uh, Europe and the rest of the world rather than here, but. Look at what's happen what happens during the coffee breaks, for example, the fact that you are able to um, speak to each other then, and also that you can see people live here rather than on your screen. That's an added value, I think, and that's an added value that we need to keep. And it should be done at a European level with the 24 official languages that we have. But we can only do that with skilled, uh, translators and interpreters. Officials of the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council, and of course the partners, our partners, freelancers, who we can call upon when we uh, need them. In May, or in June, I made, uh, this year I, I presented my proposal for the multi-annual financial framework thousands of pages long with the headings, clusters, programmes and the way in which it would be implemented in the agricultural sector, research, uh, connecting Europe, Erasmus Plus. 37 programmes over the next uh, decade, everything that should be promoted and supported by EU funds. And within a very few days, I was very impressed by the fact that this enormously long document, several thousand pages long, it was actually translated by you and your colleagues. It was translated into all of the official languages, which meant that when I went to Vilnius, when I went to Bucharest, when I went to Rome, when I went to Athens and spoke to ministers and officials and parliamentarians there, and they were already familiar with the multi-annual fra uh, financial framework. They were able to read it in their mother tongue. And that meant uh, that my discussions with them happened in an atmosphere of uh, trust and we were able to talk and get down to specifics very quickly. So thank you very much indeed to all of you for all of your work uh, over June, July, August this year. All of you who are involved in this are here in Luxembourg and elsewhere as well. Thank you very much indeed to you for that. Now, the digital revolution is uh, coming and moving very quickly forward. We're right in the middle of it. And you can only compare it with a few other revolutions, really. Printing, for example, that was the first revolution, Gutenberg in, Gutenberg in Mainz. The fact that uh, you had uh, one book that was handwritten that came from, uh, came from the, um, 
the prince's courts and then actually that book could then be printed and be made available to everybody. This was the basis for general education, science, uh, knowledge shared by many. It led to the Enlightenment, it led to democracy or electricity or the um, steam engine, everything that led towards the industrial revolution, computers, and now we've got the digital revolution. But the thing is that Europe isn't at the forefront. The digital revolution is being shaped by others, by Silicon Valley, for example, made in China 2025, Tel Aviv and Seoul. So I think that we need, therefore, to do everything that we can to ensure that digital policy is implemented at an EU level and that we digitalize our economies and our societies. Because the digital revolution is one of the reasons why we now have um, populism and neo-nationalism. We're seeing this uh, trend. But a lot of people, older people in particular, are concerned about their futures. They think, they think they're being left behind. They're going to be overshadowed by this. They're not part of social media. They're not going to be part of um, the future because of the huge amount of changes that are taking place in the work, in the labor market, but also, of course, that there could be loss, the loss of jobs as well. That's what people are afraid of. I think that it's absolutely clear that your profession, as translators of texts and also as interpreters, uh, helping people to speak to each other, will be absolutely centrally affected by the digital revolution. I don't think that your job would die out but I think that in five years' time, your job will look very different to, it, to what it did five years ago. Which is why DG Connect, DG Digit, DGT and uh, Skik enable us uh, to use their skills and for us to look at uh, what would be necessary for you, what kind of additional education do you need, looking forward to 2025, uh, so that we're not talking about wiping away your professions, we're talking about optimizing your um, profession here. I think that your jobs are necessary and will remain necessary, but they will change. But shaping future development, I think, to shape future development, it's very important that I know what you want, hardware, software, investment, and, fu and, and, and um, further training, so that you are fit for technological developments and digital technology over the next uh, few years. I've seen this uh, in the economic sectors and in the various things that I have done in my job. I've gone through a lot of translation. I've seen a lot of translation and interpreting departments in Daimler, in, um, in Stuttgart, uh, in the ministry, and then in the national parliament in Baden-Württemberg, and indeed in the Max Planck Institute as well. And I have to say that the best departments are DGT and SCIC. The number of them, but also the quality and their efficiency, their speed. And I'm not doing this just to um, give you, to put you in a good mood for the weekend. I'm saying it uh, because your quad, the quality is uh, incredible. And that's why I spoke with your Director General, the Secretary, and I've, I've spoken with them, I've had long discussions with them, and I'll continue with them. And I've said that, OK, yes, we need, we need staff in DG FISMA, in DG COM, etc., but we shouldn't actually 
get these extra posts by removing posts from DGT and, and DGSCIC. You have actually contributed to major savings, more than the 5% cuts, more than the 5% cuts in posts across the European Commission. We cut posts to deal with the financial crisis, to help member states with their, um, with their, um, with their budgets and um, negotiating trade deals with countries around the world. But I don't think that we should use you and uh, squeeze everything out of you. We shouldn't continue to squeeze you like lemons. I think that uh, we need a permanent staff, a big permanent staff of people who are employed within the Commission. And then, of course, we also need the additional flexibility of freelancers that we can call on when we need additional help. Ladies and gentlemen, the European Union is uh, under threat from inside and from outside. From inside, the rule of law Rule of law isn't something that's being properly safeguarded across the whole of the European Union. Budgetary discussions in some member states, which are not actually in line with the rules that have been agreed at an EU level. There are populists and nationalists, not just on the streets, but also in the parliaments of our member states and not just in the parliaments of our member states, but actually in governments as a smaller coalition partner or indeed as um, the one party that's in power. So we have these problems internally, but we also have enemies outside us, uh, autocrats in um, Ankara in Moscow and also in the White House uh, tweeting 24 hours a day. And certain... Um, capitalists who want to, to to become absolutely certain um, countries with that who want to rule the world with their capitalism such as uh, Beijing 2019 is um, a year of elections and if we want to keep what we've achieved so far we need to make sure that we um, feel our responsibilities and we preserve what we have achieved for our children and our grandchildren. You aren't just um, citizens of the European Union, but you also have influence and authority. You work for the European Commission, you work within the European Commission. Your neighbours, your partners, uh, your friends, the people you play tennis with, they all know what your work is, what your job is. And so they take your views seriously on this because you know more about the European Union institutions than the average person does. So please, over the next few weeks and months, do work towards the strengthening, the maintaining and the future development of the European Union. That's in the interest of peace, in the interest of our economic competitiveness, in the interest of Europe's um, openness and mobility within Europe, the freedoms of movement, and uh, in the interest of our values, uh, and that uh, everything that's been important to us since the terrible world wars that Europe went through. There will be more European Union, uh, there will be more European countries joining us, uh, Serbia, Albania, Northern Macedonia, Montenegro, Kosovo, Bos Bosnia and Her Herzegovina. So six more European countries, uh, including Orthodox populations, uh, Catholics, uh, Muslim populations, they want to join the European Union. And this, of course, will be new work for you as well. In eight or nine years' time, it won't be 24 official languages. It will be 27, 28 official languages that will be competently translated by you. 
when um, Cyprus uh, reunites, uh, then uh, if or if when or if Cyprus reunites, then um, Turkish uh, would become an official language uh, because some of the Turkish because Turkish Cypriots, Cypriots who have Turkish as a mother tongue would become citizens of the European Union. So I think that these are times are exciting, not just because of the digital revolution, but also because of the expansion of the European Union, the enlargement of the European Union. Exciting times, more exciting times to come. I would like to urge you that you see your profession. Yes, OK, it's something that you need in order to maintain your standard of living, but it's not just a job. The work that the European Commission does, that the commissioners do, that the directors general do, it wouldn't be possible without you. It's not a Tower of Babel. The Tower of Babel brought um, builders from across uh, different countries. They worked together. They weren't able to communicate with each other, though. We don't want um, the European Union to become a Tower of Babel that can never be finished. We want it to be something that is, effect that is uh, successfully concluded, and we need you to do that. So thank you very much uh, to you, to the Director General, to the Director General, to you, to all of the work that you do. And thank you to all of the partners who, through the interest, um, through their interest in their profession, actually accepted the invitation from the European Union to attend this fifth conference. Thank you very much to all of you.